always live and always wild. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this Tuesday edition. It is the AfriCam Show, and we are live and interactive, and we are looking at a beautiful Nile crocodile in a very cute position, I must say. At this angle, they look very, very cute. And I'm glad to start the show off with them. So if this is the first time you're joining us, thank you so much. We're live and interactive, so you can send through your questions and your comments. I'd love to hear from you all. And you have the opportunity to ask whatever you like. There are no silly questions. As my chemistry teacher once said to me, only silly answers. So I hope that you're ready to learn for the next half an hour with me because I'm certainly excited. I know that I saw you last week, but I feel like I haven't seen you for a while. Uh, and I'm glad that some hellos have come through already. We've got Zygote that says, hi, Trishala. Kauru that says, hi, Trishala. And dear NC that says, good morning from Seattle. You're ready with your coffee. Wonderful. Sorry about that, guys. I know it was lovely to start with that crop. We're having a little bit of difficulty there. But I do love a Nile crocodile. But maybe we'll see one here at Tao as well. I remember there were a few around at one point, but there is a lot going on just in general here at Tao. There were some elephants earlier, so I hope that they come through as well. We've got some wildebeest in the background, some impala, just on the left. And that pair of jackals were around as well. Now, I love spending time with jackals, and I hope they'll make an appearance again, because having a jackal den is just the most wonderful thing. It's an opportunity to really, really get to know them well. This bird that we have on the rock there, I'm struggling to see exactly what it is, but it looks pretty big. And very black and white. I'm actually a little bit stumped. Um, at first I thought maybe it's a, a African black duck, but it's definitely not, not with that kind of uh, contrasting or such dark contrasting colors, but we can see that it's got long legs, and it's certainly at the water's edge. Well, I'll think about it, and then we can, uh, we can always get back. <laughs> Virginia Paul, you say hi, Trishala. Hi, Virginia. Thank you so much for joining us. You can actually see that we are starting to move from the very wet, beautiful green season into the slightly drier time of the year as we've entered autumn now. Oh, lovely. We've got some yellow bolt stalks. Oh, <laughs> this is so nice. They're actually taking a bit of a seat on their wrist. But a uh, heron on this side as well, towards the right. A nice grey heron. Feels very birdy today, which is wonderful. It always strikes me how apparent it is when we get a change of the season. At the height of the wet season, everything is so, so, so green. 
but you can sort of see it kind of fade. Um, and a lot of the time, we, you know, our memories work in, in strange ways, but I can remember things like, oh, in the summer of that time or in the winter of that time, and that's because it's such a stark difference between the wet and the dry season. Visually, I mean, there isn't in Africa, particularly in southern Africa, there isn't a huge difference between um, summer and spring, winter and autumn. Yeah, there's this transitionary period, but it's it's not as dark as it is in the northern hemisphere. So here we just basically have a dry season and a wet season, and between those two, you can really see the difference. These birds are just chilling, which is quite nice to see. Obviously, not too much in the water for them to take advantage of right now, or perhaps they're just taking a bit of a break. Jan Powell, you say hi all. Another beautiful day in Arizona. Oh, I'm very glad to hear it. Zygote, uh, you say it's scary earlier when the croc's mouth opened. Ah. Yes, that croc uh, can be quite, well, I mean, any croc can be quite scary. They're absolutely apex predators, stocky bodies, really well built, amazing um, force that can be exerted by their jaws. And to see it open, I mean, that's just a, it leads your imagination to all the things that it can trap within those jaws. Bob from Kalamazoo, you say good day to me. Thank you, Bob. Virginia Paul, you say jackals are so much fun. They really are so much fun. Virginia, I'll tell you a little silly story. Um, so I'm at home here in Cape Town, and we actually get jackal buzzards around quite a lot. But I haven't heard a jackal buzzard in a while. Now, if you're unfamiliar with a jackal buzzard or why it's called a jackal buzzard, it's because it calls like a jackal. So it sounds like a jackal is making this call. And so there I was, and I was actually looking at videos that I had taken of jackals. So I was going through these videos, and I could hear the jackals calling. Oh, lovely. We're back at the croc. Wonderful. So I was hearing these jackals calling and uh, in the videos that I was trying to edit, and then... I thought I could hear a jackal as well. Um, but it turned out to be a jackal buzzard on my roof. But I had a, a serious kind of where am I, what dimension, what is going on, have I lost my mind moment. I do love, love jackals. So here we go. We're back at our crocky. Gosh, it does look very cute like this. But here you can see just how stocky the body is. It's taking a bit of a nap, sunning itself. Obviously, these are ectotherms, which means that they're cold-blooded. doesn't mean that their blood is cold. They still have to be able to maintain certain temperatures so that their metabolism and everything can work as it should. It's just that it cannot keep homeostasis. It cannot maintain its own body heat in the way that we can. So it has to rely essentially on the ambient temperatures and behavioral changes to make sure that it can keep its metabolism going. So now it's sunning itself, which would be great because having a, a little extra heat in the body will aid its digestion. So a lot of the time, we don't really think about, so we know oh, something's cold-blooded, something's warm-blooded, we understand the basics of it. Warm-blooded, you can sort yourself out internally, your body's processes are handling your internal temperatures. Cold-blooded, not so much, ambient temperatures are influencing your internal temperature. But that has really significant implications for what's going on inside of you. So this croc uh, had a huge meal even maybe not even a huge meal, had a meal, it would, may, it would need there to be a certain temperature in its body for digestion to take place. Because if there isn't, if it's too cold, digestion can halt. And that can cause, the whole, cause a host of problems 
for a reptile. So by sunning itself, I mean, assuming, or with this example, that it's had a meal, by sunning itself, it can increase its body temperature and make digestion a much easier process. For many reptiles, and I've seen this with pythons before, they will have a large meal and they've really got to make sure that they can keep, keep their body temperature up sufficiently, oh, look at this, <laughs> sufficiently to allow the digestive process to take place. Once it starts happening, then digestion in itself will create some kind of heat. Oh, isn't that amazing? Now, can you see that part that's inside of its mouth, that flap of skin there? That's not its tongue. That's kind of the back of its throat, or like the end of your palate if you were to open your own mouth. He's moving it just up and down, just a little bit, almost like a bit of a contraction. So that is actually its gula. So you might have he heard the term gula fluttering. That's when that flap of skin starts fluttering. And that's exactly what he was doing. Albeit not exactly fluttering, but he was moving it. And what that does is create a nice bit of airflow over that area to allow for evaporative cooling. So a good example of this is, you know when you're in public bathrooms and there's these, uh, what do you call them, those hand dryers that push out this warm air. So if you just put your hand under there, it's not really going to dry. I mean, it'll still dry, but it takes a little bit of time. But if you continually move your hands, you're creating a little bit of extra airflow a little bit of extra movement and evaporation becomes that much easier. So he is using it for the opposite way that we are, not trying to dry out his gula, but instead trying to create sufficient air movement so that the cooler air outside of his body can pull heat from his gula. And in that gula area, lots of blood is moving through all the time. And as that cools, it cools the blood as well. It's a really delicate, delicate balance for reptiles. Because, you know, on one hand, while well, he's out sunning himself, so clearly he wants to get warm. But at the same time, he's opening his mouth and fluttering his gula. So he's trying to cool down. But we have to, so for us, it's like, oh, well, which Sorry guys, if you lose me briefly, I'm so sorry. I'm not sure what happened there. But I was going on and on about this pup because I <laughs> didn't realize that I was that I was gone. But I'm back. I was uh, saying some some hellos, I'm not sure if you got them all, but it was Trainer Matt 51 that said, Good morning from North Carolina, USA. 
and Lisa White said good day from Washington State. And now we have an Impala and an Egyptian Goose that are having a bit of a daring contest. <laughs> <laughs> Impalas have really wide pupils, or rather uh, rectangular pupils, so sort of in the same way that cattle do. So it is able to have quite a wide field of view. So even though it was not staring directly at that Egyptian goose, it was definitely able to see it. Andy, absolutely, we're still chatting about that croc. Andy says the sand can get pretty hot too. Absolutely, and the crocodiles will make use of that. There we go. We're back at our good old croc. He's making use of the of the warm sand now. I mean, obviously, where he at is placed, that sand is not going to be hot as as hot as the sand that's been exposed to the sun the entire time. Lisa White, she said, really, I really like crocs. They fascinate me. They are absolutely fascinating. Karu, you say, do they do this for the same reason birds do? So Karu is talking about the gula flattering. Yes. So crocs and birds are actually closely related. There's an ancient group of animals called archosaurs, and both crocs and birds are descendants of archosaurs. Now, if you were unsure or you didn't know, birds are what we call avian dinosaurs. So they are flying dinosaurs. They are direct descendants of dinosaurs. So at the end of the Cretaceous, when dinosaurs went extinct, not all of them went extinct. Smaller dinosaurs did survive. And those smaller ones are the ancestors of what we know today as birds. Birds are not, the ancestors of birds are not things like pterosaurs, which were flying dinosaurs, but rather small dinosaurs that managed to survive that mass extinction. Now, crocodiles are, or at one point, shared a common ancestor with birds, but they are both in the group called archosaurs. You might have also heard that crocodiles are living fossils, that they have remained unchanged for millions and millions and millions of years. And I can see why, because they look very prehistoric. And really, their body plan and their morphology, the way that they look to us, has not changed very much for, for many millions of years. But this Nile crocodile right here that we are looking at is the product of the same amount of evolutionary time as we are. A crocodilia as a group has existed for about, I think about 95 million years, so a really, really long time. But the crocodile that we see today, modern crocodiles, have only been around for about 11 million years. And I say only, you know, I mean, 11 million years is a huge amount of time, but it's not the same as being around for 100 or 200 million years, which is something that you see quoted quite a bit, and it's not, not really true. Um, and that's just crocodilia as a group. Nile crocodiles specifically, probably a lot less than that. Um, 8 million years comes to mind, but I'll have to double check that because I haven't, haven't read up on Crocs evolution in a while, and I do love to chat about evolution. And here we have another little enigma. <laughs> it is a Dusty. Now, I'm not sure if, okay, there we go. I was not sure if I, you know, got lost again, and if I was... I was stuck, or the dusty was stuck, or it had just really found its own very nice little nook here. Now, you're we talking about um, traits and evolution and evolutionary relationships. 
and I said that this one's another really cool relationship and that's because you might have often heard that Dasis are the closest living relatives to elephants. It is true, it's not just Dasis, it's Dasis and Cyrenians. So Cyrenians are the group of animals that, that include dugongs or manatees and they are closely related in the sense that there's nothing else that exists currently that is more closely related to this group. But if you imagine that, we, that you put your one hand to the left, all the way to the left, and you say, these are dussies, and all the way to the right and say, these are elephants. There were tons and tons of species in between them that would have made that, that chain of relationship a lot easier to understand. But unfortunately, they have gone extinct. So what we're left with are these two individuals, or these two individual species, that seem really far apart, but at the moment, currently, they are the most closely related. And if you look at a dusty, you can kind of see it as well. They're kind of this um, semi-digitigrade, kind of plantigrade uh, foot structure, which means that they're kind of fully on their foot, but not quite. The heel is kind of lifted, but not actually digitigrade, which is when just your digits are touching the ground, which is very similar to the foot structure of an elephant. Now also, dusties have tiny little tusks. Remember that tusks are just modif modified inside the teeth. And dusties have little tusks inside of their mouth, which again, are just modified inside the teeth. So they do share some characteristics. And they definitely shared a common ancestor. And they are most definitely the closest living relative with the Cyrenians, those dugongs and um, manatees. These are the most closely related relatives to elephants. Sorry, I went on, a sp on an evolutionary spiral. I get very excited looking at relationships like this because it, I love knowing how things are connected. I think it is absolutely wonderful. All right, we are back with our heron. Yes, oh, for a moment I thought it might have been um, a black heron. Sorry, a black-headed heron. But it is, in fact, the grey variety. Salmon. Drive bunny, you would like to know, do crocs lie on their backs? Um, I haven't seen a croc, like, stun itself on its back. <laughs> back to our shaky croc. I've never seen them sun themselves on their backs. Remember, it'll be quite a compromising position, and even an apex predator does not want to be in a compromising position um, or a particularly vulnerable position. Just imagine lions coming down to drink. Just because they're an apex predator themselves doesn't mean they're going to be. Ex they're not going to be extra cautious. They still are. So I've never seen one on its back. Whoa, that looks a bit menacing. Yes, it does. Let's see if it's going to flutter its gula again. No fluttering. Oh, a little bit. Let me see the contraction. Ooh, this is so wonderful to see. Um, to wrap up your question, Jive Bunny, I've only seen the underbelly of a croc when they have done their death roll. Otherwise, not so much. 
But also remember, if you look at the scales on the top of a croc's body, so a crocodile has many scales across its body, but they're not overlapping. And we actually call this particular type of scale an osteoderm. And you can kind of see it, kind of think of it as, um, what's the right word? Fortified, maybe not the right word, but there's a fortified by bone. So there's a whole lot of bone that's merged with the scale. So that's extra armory. But on the belly, the, the scales are not osteoderms. They're just flat scales. So it's a really vulnerable thing to show, to show the belly. So I haven't seen it except for when they do their death roll, which is when they hold onto their prey in water, sometimes outside of water too, but mostly in water, and then will roll their body to break up their prey very efficiently, I might add. Jural, you say, good morning, Trishala. Good morning, Jural. You've got your morning Java. Oh. Love to hear exactly which variety of coffee you're drinking. And you're saying that you enjoy the information about the Nile, clo uh, Nile Croc. You're glad to have me back. I'm very glad to have myself back. Africam is uh, definitely one of my homes. So I'm happy to spend this time with all of you. We're also getting a really great view of their teeth, which, mind you, is not going to be your biggest issue when uh, or if these jaws snap down, unfortunately, on anything that you own or let's not say the other. The teeth are very conical shaped, so then they don't have this typical kind of canine monster sharp sword-like shape. They're conical shaped and that actually makes quite a bit of sense. So uh, teeth that are robust in this way, it's something that hyenas have as well. They don't have the typical very sharp teeth that you see in predators. It's more of this conical shape. But teeth like this are able to exert more pressure for a larger surface area. And they can really hold on tight uh, and are less likely to break. So you know that they are saber, or they once were saber-toothed cats, which are not actually true cats, but they, uh, they were saber-toothed. And those were long, long canine teeth. But actually, evidence suggests that those cats would actually only use it once they had already caught, and caught their prey and were just trying to kill it. So just trying to, you know, slit the, th the throat. And that's because those teeth were really, really delicate. They were super sharp and super long. So that's a good example of, um, of the opposite of what the croc is trying to achieve. Because they have such a strong bite force. And I've heard the bite force being quoted anything from 1,800 PSI, which is something that I'm familiar with for hippos. That's the bite force exerted by hippos. Uh, and then 3,000 PSI, which I think is more appropriate for a croc. And then I've even heard 5,000 PSI, which is a huge amount of force to exert. Um, and I'm not sure that male crocodiles can exert that force. Apparently, it has been recorded with uh, saltwater crocodiles, but perhaps they can. Now, if you're exerting that much of force, you're going to definitely break your teeth if they are long and pointed and sharp. And with that kind of force, you don't need that sharp teeth because the force is going to do all that work. There we go, really showing it off now. And you can see the shape done. In. Oh! I'm so glad. Some beautiful, beautiful ends to end us off. The time has come. I'm going, just going to go through two more comments. Jarrell, you say the crocs belly looks like it may be tender, very white looking. Quite a contrast. Yeah, absolutely. It's very it's a vulnerable, vulnerable spot. Um, 
Hi, Goat. We see, and I'm glad that we're looking. We saw the Jesse earlier, and we're looking at these elephants now. We were talking about their relationship, albeit far. Still the closest that we have alive today. Saigo, you say, Elephant and Dasi got so upset that they never wanted to see each other. So elephants don't climb hills and elephant Dasis don't climb down. <laughs> that is a great, great story. Thank you, Saigo. And thank you all for joining us. I hope that you enjoyed your time with me today. I will see you on Thursday. Have a good day wherever you are and thank you for all your questions and your comments. It's always a pleasure to spend this time with you. Bye for now.